Okay, I appreciate that. So let's see. I'm going to uh, share my screen here momentarily. Now, I've divided this talk into two. Today, I'm going to be speaking about J pouches, controversies in surgery, frilial pouch anal anastomosis. And then next month in November, I'm going to be showing videos on different pouch techniques. So I've kind of divided it into the the data supporting it, and then the video. So let's talk about some of the controversies. And I've listed them here. I won't read them. But but these are some of the current controversies. And some of these controversies are less controversial, have been resolved. But but let's, let's go through them because it's important to understand what you're going to see in the videos next month. When the pouch was first described by uh, Joji Utsunomiya and Hyogo Japan in 1979 and the S pouch by Alan Parks and in, in, in St. Mark's Hospital in London. The idea of the J pouch was to strip out all of the mucosa commencing at the dentate line and create an anastomosis here right to the dentate line. So this mucosal stripping would totally eliminate, theoretically, the risk of cancer and the risk of inflammation in the entirety of the colitis rectum, leaving a pouch anal anastomosis. Um, but the theory behind it didn't really bear out. So over time, it was discovered that roughly one in five patients who had a mucosectomy still had rectal mucosa retained in that muscular cuff, meaning patients could get cancer, patients could get inflammation in an area you couldn't see or biopsy. So in 1989, 10 years after the introduction of pouches, along with my late partner, David Jagelman, Michael Keithley in Birmingham, England, in the same month, both uh, Mike and one of our former alumni, who unfortunately passed away, Whit Kimiat, uh, in 1989, we published double stapling, taking the technique of Knight and Griffith from rectal cancer and adopting it to ulcerative colitis and familial adenomatous polyposis for um, double stapling J pouches. And over time, what bore out, again, this isn't even a new article, it's, it's uh, 17 years old, but even at that time, it was shown that there was better nocturnal continence. Again, you weren't disrupting the nerves in the anal transitional zone. And although the risk of dysplasia may exist, it didn't uh, turn out to be much. So looking a few years later, over 3,000 patients at the Cleveland Clinic, and you can see hand-sewn versus stapled, hand-sewn anastomoses, much, much higher rate of bleeding, not from the anastomosis, but from the mucosectomy, and very importantly, more incontinence after mucosectomy, and a much higher failure rate, almost triple. You can look at the difference in continence, 12%, 4%, and pouch failure rate, stapled remaining very constant uh, at 12 percent and the hand sewn keeps failing and failing because of strictures because of sepsis because of functional problems so did this risk of dysplasia or cancer or colitis really pan out again this is why utsunami and park just both described doing the mucosectomy to eliminate this risk and, and jagelman and i and mike keithley both said do you really need to do that? Why don't you preserve that little one or two centimeters of anal transitional zone and you can look at it and biopsy it? Well, it turns out there was almost no dysplasia. There was no cancer. And, and when somebody has dysplasia, you can easily do a pouch advancement. Uh, so you monitor these patients. Um, you can get polyps in that area, but there's no difference uh, when you do a hand sewn or, or other or, or a double staple in terms of risk of cancer between the two groups. So the next controversy is diversion. Typically, when we perform an anastomosis, and this one shows a hand sewn at the dentate line, but when we perform an anastomosis, we divert it to mitigate against the potential adverse sequelae of an anastomotic leak. But having an ileostomy is potentially uncomfortable for the patient, uh, adds a second operation at least a second operation, maybe more, uh, increases hospital stay. So one study we had from Cleveland from one of our alumni who, again, unfortunately passed away, Joe Chandra from uh, Australia, a 30-year-old study, but but still rings true today. Uh, so, so they're relatively safe unless the dose of, of uh, prednisone is over 20 milligrams daily, but 
the early function when an ileostomy is omitted is significantly worse. So having the ileostomy allows time for that pouch to adapt and, and function like a rectum versus when it's immediately hit with stool, these patients have tremendous urgency, frequency, worse quality of life. Uh, this is a prospective study from uh, Mark Peppercorn and uh, Peter Mashosin. Uh, without diversion, stapled anastomosis, you can get by with it. I mean, these are all the problems. You can get by with it, but it, it certainly is at a risk. And I think one of the better studies to look at that risk is the amalgamate study from the UK and the US with a, a lot of uh, folks, say Mark's Hospital, Cleveland Clinic, Oxford, uh, comparative studies, 1,500 patients, relatively similarly matched, uh, higher risk of leak, higher risk of stricture. So I don't know anybody in this day and age that practices one-stage pouches. In fact, it's often gone to three-stage now because of biologics, JAK inhibitors, small molecules on top of the prednisone that people take. Um, there are certain disadvantages uh, Two, so a retrospective study, complication rate similar, but leaks higher in the group without an ileostomy. And we looked at some of the problems with the ileostomy itself, and the complications of loop ileostomy closure are not insignificant being listed on the left-hand side here. So having a stoma, as well as closing a stoma, is potentially problematic, uh, but I think still worth doing uh, for safety in these patients. Lots of potential problems. You can see here total complications, total reoperations, 8%. Not insignificant, but all better than a pelvic anastomotic leak. Um, obviously, the hospital time is going to be greater for sure. And you may need more readmissions after stoma reversal, in part because of hernias. These sites are classic for developing uh, hernias at the old stoma site. Now, one thing you can do is uh, to, to mitigate some of this is if you do your first operation laparoscopically. So if you perform laparoscopy rather than laparotomy, you're going to have a lower complication rate, shorter length of stay, less ileus, less blood loss, significant benefits by laparoscopy. So laparoscopic pouch with diversion, despite the fact that the ileostomy has potential problems as does the site of the ileostomy later on in terms of hernias. Indeterminate colitis. You know, the more we know about ulcerative colitis, the less we know because of this overlap area between ulcerative colitis and, and, and Crohn's disease. And when we look at the literature over about this 10-year stretch here, people haven't paid a lot of attention to it lately, but over this 10-year stretch, you can see that basically the complication rates are the same or in some studies higher. This one includes ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and indeterminate colitis. And you can see the indeterminate colitis complication rate falls in between the Crohn's and the uh, ulcerative colitis. Pouch loss, almost the same. Functional outcome, almost the same. And, and I think the bottom line here with indeterminate colitis, if the patient has stigmata of Crohn's like rectal sparing, like history of perianal sepsis, like so-called backwash ileitis. That's probably not indeterminate colitis. That's probably Crohn's colitis and should be treated as such. But if the basis of indeterminate colitis is that um, the patient had fulminant colitis and the pathologist couldn't make a diagnosis on the removed colon, and remember, to have the diagnosis of indeterminate colitis requires a removed colon. It's not a diagnosis made on colonoscopic biopsy. So having the colon removed and the pathologist still can't tell because it was fulminant disease, that's truly indeterminate colitis, not some of the other things. But basically, the most important of all of those is perianal disease. When a patient has a history of perianal sepsis, fissure abscess, uh, sorry, fistular abscess, that augurs for failure. Next age. I mean, the world is getting older, certainly. A couple of years ago, you had percent 60-year-old or here. As we progress, particularly... Uh, the United States, not, not India, but lots of other countries in, in Europe, the, the Mideast, uh, China, and so on. A lot of places are going to be older and older population. When pouches were first done, 
the caveat was they should not be performed in patients over age 40. But I can tell you that obviously rapidly changed as we got more comfortable with it and as all the surgeons were over age 40. And you can see here a variety of studies. This one is from our unit here. This one is from our unit here. This one's from our unit here. Looking at different ages, you could see bowel frequency the same or sometimes slightly higher in older patients, continence the same, maybe declining with time, morbidity and mortality more or less the same, except elderly patients more predisposed to dehydration. Uh, looking at a systematic review more recently from our unit in Cleveland, uh, pelvic sepsis, um, a, a 10%, probably not much different than the other population. Bowel frequency, pretty much what you'd expect, 6 or 7 BMs in 24 hours. Incontinence is the issue. These patients have a higher rate of incontinence, particularly seepage at night, and arguably a bit of a higher pouch failure rate than other patients. What's important is physiologic age, not chronologic age. So the patient who's 78 years old and tells me they play tennis every Saturday, golf every Sunday, they go to the office five days a week to help out, uh, they travel internationally, that's a patient I'd consider doing a J-pouch. On the other hand, the 70-year-old patient who <coughs> is more or less confined to the house uh, morbidly obese, taking uh, all kinds of drugs for comorbidities? No, because the healthier patients can tolerate problems if they occur, the unhealthy ones can't. How about obesity? Speaking of morbid obesity, the world is getting larger and larger and larger. And again, India, thanks to healthy diets uh, and other factors, obviously, is still not in that category, but I suppose it's only a matter of time. So the first study we did looking at pouches in the obese back 22 years ago showed that there was a higher rate of pelvic sepsis in obese patients. Um, we also had a higher, little bit higher, uh, post-operative morbidity. Again, not surprising. And obviously, it took longer to operate on these patients. These were open pouches. Um, this is a study from uh, Christian Herfarth in, in Germany. 59 patients, laparoscopic, and they found that BMI, elevated BMI, is a significant risk factor for conversion. We went back and looked at that a couple of years later, uh, non-obese and obese in a, in a cohort-matched uh, population, and found, yes, the operative times were still significantly longer, um, and the length of stay was higher. And so th there were certain adverse outcomes in obese patients. Similar complications, longer time in surgery, longer time in the hospital, and not surprisingly, a higher rate of incisional hernia later on. Um, this is an interesting study from the Mayo Clinic group where they looked at over a thousand patients. They found in almost 2% of pouch didn't reach. And they tried to find out why that pouch didn't reach. And BMI was the number one factor. Uh, the odds ratio here, 1.26. And you can see they mapped out BMI. So when you go from uh, underweight and ideal body mass index, it just starts to creep up at that break point between overweight and obese. And when you start getting to class one, two, three, four obesity, ultimately you get to a point when the patient's BMI is 60, there is 0% chance that a pouch will reach. And it's helpful to have a graph like this to show patients so they understand why they need to lose weight. The next issue uh, is um, reducing short-term complications. And, and this study from uh, the University of Rochester looked at lap versus open pouches. And like every other facet of laparoscopy we do, um, the outcomes are better. Uh, this one's kind of interesting, again, from the Mayo Clinic. Um, Better continence. Absolutely no explanation why continence would be better when the pouches are double stapled in both groups, but nonetheless, they found that for whatever the reason is, the laparoscopic pouches had better continence. You can see here uh, numerically, daytime frequency uh, better in favor of laparoscopic pouches. Ditto for nocturnal frequency, ditto for complete continence. Everything improved with laparoscopic pouches. Um, doing a, a 
pace match comparison a couple of years ago from our group in Ohio, 404 patients, lap versus open. Again, laparoscopic was significantly better for stool frequency and for continence and energy. So same as the Mayo Clinic, for whatever the reason, Cleveland Clinic North also found better outcomes using uh, laparoscopy versus open. Using our American College Surgeon's NISQIP database, it was found that laparoscopic had lower complication rates. Not surprisingly, uh, we wouldn't expect otherwise, but the continence was a surprise. So having lo you know, better complication rates, sure, having better continence, less frequency was a bit surprising. We went back and, and looked at, at the data for uh, abandonment of pouch creation, like the Mayo Clinic group did. Their, their abandonment rate was 1.82%, ours was 1.5% inadequate reach technical gender again bmi uh was a risk factor as was a two-stage procedure now something that's come on the scene and i mentioned this earlier on top of our uh, armamentarium we used to have a prednisone and 6mp and methotrexate now we have all other manner of treating drugs whether you use a, a step up or, or a step down approach You've got so many drugs on the market. It changes literally daily with anti-TNFs, biologics, JAK inhibitors, small molecules. There's just a host of ways to treat patients. And the more drugs there are, the more we have to question, is there effect on our surgical outcomes? And, and the evidence are not, it, it's mixed. So Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, Phil Fleshner, found that there was no difference in surgical complications. The group at the Mayo Clinic, however, found that infleximab, the original of these agents uh, back in the early 2000s, um, did cause more or was associated with more anastomotic leaks and more infectious complications. And went to the point of saying uh, at our group in Ohio that when the patient was on infleximab, maybe they should have a three-stage procedure because of the increased complication rate more sepsis, more late complications. Um, the Mayo Clinic looked at it again um, and found more patients on infleximib, as we had suggested in Cleveland North, in fact, had three-stage procedures. As time went on, though, we started to see less clarity for complications. And here, by this point in 2012, started to see no difference in complications with or without infleximib. And ultimately, this large uh, observational study came out uh, led by uh, Bruce Sands with people from all over the country, observational study, and they collected uh, the, the drug exposure levels within 12 weeks of surgery, and they had either exposed or unexposed patients, multivariable analysis, and the bottom line, not associated with increased risk of infection after surgery. So, Fielder's choice, it seems we originally panicked, now we're less panicked and patients can be taking their drugs. As time goes on, some pouches fail. And looking at this study from just a couple of years ago, 116 patients, you can see that there is a failure rate, about 7% of 20 years in that study. Uh, usually pouchitis, obstruction, or, or fistula. And what I'm going to cover next time, I wanted to give you a little preview there. Next time, I'm going to go into um, some of those uh, problems long-term with pouches, how we manage some of those problems long-term with pouches, and as promised, show you some videos next time. I know you like videos, but I wanted to set the stage. So next time, we're going to go through some videos as well on pouch procedures and pouch salvage procedures.